Kia ora. We're live on Zoom and Facebook Live on a number of different Facebook pages. Na mihi nui ki a koutou, nau mai hari mai, ki te tene hui mariko. So I'm Barry Coates. I'm the founder and CEO of uh, Mindful Money. Uh, welcome to uh, hui mariko which I have learned means our online conference. Uh, we've got uh, a, a great lineup for you tonight. Uh, this is a longer session than we normally have. Uh, so uh, we, uh, it is my great pleasure uh, to uh, welcome all of our panelists, most of you who will, uh, most of you will meet them as the panel starts and uh, we uh, will do introductions to everyone. Um, the order of, of the conference is that we are going to be addressed by uh, Jane Wrightson, the Retirement Commissioner, in a minute, and uh, uh, we're going to have time for a question or two, and then we'll go to our first panel, which is about outreach uh, to the public on, on ethical investing or responsible investing, um, and we'll have time for question and answer on that. Uh, then I'm going to say a couple of things about Mindful Money. We're, we're uh, launching uh, retail investment funds on our platform. So, so uh, I'll, uh, I'll say a few brief words about that. And then we'll go into a second panel at around about uh, eight o'clock. Uh, and that second panel uh, will look particularly at the role of investment in taking action on climate change. Uh, we'll then uh, have, again, Q&A on that panel, and we'll wrap up by 8.30. So I hope you can all stay for the duration uh, of the conference. I realise it's kind of a long time online, so uh, uh, so please uh, uh, please hang in there. There's uh, some, some great uh, kōrero to, to come, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. The way it works is, is that... Uh, um, I'm afraid you, you're going to be uh, muted, um, but the way you ask questions is to put your questions in writing into the Zoom chat. Uh, if you're on Zoom and if you're on Facebook Live on any one of the pages, uh, put it into the comments section of the pages and we've got somebody monitoring the Facebook pages who will then deliver those comments to us and we can ask questions. So that's the way it works. Um, I'm going to crack straight into it and give a very warm welcome to uh, our still fairly new retirement commissioner, uh, Jane Wrightson. Uh, Jane took up her role in February this year. Um, she was previously chief executive uh, of mm -hmm. New Zealand On Air, uh, the Broadcasting Standards Authority, Screen Producers Association, and was New Zealand's first woman chief censor. So um, it's fantastic to have you, Jane, and uh, uh, it's lovely that you're doing it uh, uh, so so really early into your role and just after um, the Money Week has happened last week. So um, please, I invite you to give us an address. Kia ora, Barry. Uh, ngā mihi mahana o te wā ki e tātou. Ko te mata, te maonga, ko ngāruroro te awa, ko heratonga, taku tūranga waiwai, ko pōniki, taku kāinga i nāene, ko Jane Wrightson toko ingoa. Uh, for those of you who speak less Māori than I do, I basically said I'm a visitor from Hawke's Bay. Um, and thank you, Barry, for allowing me to speak virtually, as it turns out. Um, we do appreciate you originally timed the event to uh, coincide with our annual Sorted Money Week campaign, which this year, of course, falls in the middle of a year in which a pandemic has upended everything that we know. Um, especially pungent among COVID-19's bouquet of anxieties, the disease itself, another lockdown, perhaps not the last, the horror of closed borders, is the growing sense nothing will ever be quite the same again. Barring a miracle cure, history suggests that this fear, unlike that whole ridiculous 5G thing, has basis in reality. 
I read an amazing article in Bloomberg uh, this April that looked at the studies of pandemic data going all the way back to the Black Death. Um, it was pretty clear, pandemics alter economies for decades. They boost the power of labor, which I was interested in. Uh, they lower the return on capital, which we kind of know, and they lead to slower growth and slower interest rates. The Bank of England is also unequivocal. Wars are better for the economy than pandemics. Please, God, no. But out of a crisis comes opportunity. On a micro level in the last lockdown, we're going to cut our own hair, decree the results not terrible, baked bread, and learned a lesson. This virus is teaching consumers to do things for themselves and spend cautiously. Research that we at the CFFC released last week showed that New Zealanders' financial capability actually improved after lockdown, during lockdown, after the initial panic. Um, the Kiwi saver fluctuations shocked them into paying attention. Um, they were able to save during lockdown and realised that having a buffer account was a good idea. Once people start having some extra cash stashed away, and see how little they can earn from a bank account these days, they'll start looking for ways to put that money to work. But my Lord, the economists are gloomy creatures. Um, I could laugh about this not being one, but I'm getting increasingly concerned that we are doing in the heads of our young people. CFFC research published this week found that 18 to 30 year olds were bucking the trend of people getting better informed. The younger cohort told us that money was there to be spent, up to 42% compared to 29% pre-COVID, and 37% said they were living today, just for today in June, compared to 25% of the general population. Why? They're an anxious generation for a start. Those of us who parent them will attest to this. And the world to them, even pre-COVID, was looking grim. Now they're taking the brunt of the job losses, insecure employment and wage cuts. If we want younger New Zealanders to have hope for their future, to take control of their lives and start preparing to run the country, then we really must start talking more positively. I, for one, do not want to, gen to damage a generation's hopes and dreams. And all who revel in dire predictions, many with a strong sense of superiority, need to consider the effect of their direness on the well-being of our young people. Yes, we have challenges. Yes, it's a tough time. Yes, there may be worst to come for some time yet. But rather than harping on like Jeremiah, Let's look for opportunity for good change. Be grateful we live in a country that is managing this better than many, even if imperfectly at times. And understand that permanent black hat bleating does more harm than good for our people. Supreme Court Judge Joe Williams tells a lovely story about Coupe and the Hawaiian navigating skills that guided the Great Waka to these shores. Can you see the island? is the question for navigators and of course leaders. His old navigator telling the story says, you must keep that island in your mind for you are the navigator. There will be heavy seas and storms and dark starless nights on your journey. But if you lose that island in your mind, you will die and your crew will die too. In other words, the more radical the journey, the clearer the island image must be for us. Can we see the island in the middle of the radical COVID? Not clearly yet, but we can imagine the post-COVID world we want, not the apocalyptic one, and this is what we need to be talking about. And COVID deserves a joke to poke it in the eye. What's the difference between COVID-19 and Romeo and Juliet? One's the coronavirus and the others a Verona crisis. I have a literature degree, how can you tell? What I can't tell, of course, is whether you're smiling or eye rolling at that one. So I come now to investing and specifically mindful investing. 
It may be that one of the silver linings of this pandemic storm will be a greater attention to investing ethically as global economies reimagine themselves to be more sustainable. Lockdowns worldwide are literally clearing the air and we're putting two and two together. Producing and consuming less stuff is better for the planet. How do we reduce the amount of stuff we make and unnecessary services we provide while keeping people in work? Economies have the opportunity to do things differently, to rebuild more sustainably, more ethically. Young people care about this a lot, and women. And according to our CFFC research, investors would welcome this shift with open arms. Our 2019 study done for the uh, three yearly review of retirement income policies found that 74% of KiwiSaver investors are interested in ethical investment. And women were found to be more likely than men to want certain category bans from, from KiwiSaver funds. Topping the list were animal cruelty, 83% of women want this category banned compared to 73% of men. Worker exploitation, 80% of women, 70% of men. Whaling, 70% of women and 69% of men. And weapons, 70% of women and 57% of men. If economies and within them investments were to become more sustainable, this could lead to another seismic shift, an increase in the number of women keen to invest. Women on average are less confident than men at investing, are more risk averse, and less likely to plan financially long-term. <clears throat> of most concern to us is that they don't see money as important, failing to make the connection between money per se and the ability it gives them to provide for what is important to them. This is also reflected in Māori and Pacifica populations. What they do see as important is family, caring for others and the environment, and limiting things that harm society and the environment. The research I just mentioned suggests women might perhaps be more ethically minded than men. Could a greening of investment be the key to greater investment activity by women? Could they see investing in ethical funds and ethical companies not as some disconnected money thing, but as a way to help those closest to them? The benefit of investing, increased personal wealth, would almost be a byproduct, yet it would enable to provide them better uh, for their family and community. COVID-19 will eventually subside, leaving New Zealand and the world with the opportunity to build a more humane system that leaves us more resilient in the face of future pandemics and other impending crises like climate change. Will we take that opportunity? If we play it right, we could end up with a more sustainable world, a more sustainable economy, and better balance in investing between men and women. If we don't play it right, We'll focus on replicating a global and national economy that was already in trouble, not addressing climate change adequately, focused on growth, not sustainability, not even starting to deal with the scourge of plastic and other environmental issues that simply can't continue at the scale they were. Actually doing something about this at our national level, the level we can control, will be the most hopeful thing we can give young New Zealanders. The theme of this year's Money Week was just wondering, encouraging New Zealanders to ask questions and receive answers they can trust from Sorted. It's been nice to be asked to wonder about the big picture of economic recovery and how it could look better than what we had before. Um, sadly, you've already figured this out. I'm not genius enough to give you all the answers, but I like that you're all thinking deeply and that mindful money is promoting change. Um, so thank you for having me. I'm sorry we won't be propping up the bar afterwards having it a drink like an ordinary conference, but I hope tonight is useful for those um, tuning in. Um, no David, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jane. That was, uh, that was a great way to start the, the conference. And uh, I really appreciated the way you segued from 
a general feeling of optimism for the future into the financial aspects of it. And uh, uh, the Commission for Financial Capability does great work in, in building financial capability. So, so that's, that's good. Um, maybe just one, uh, one quick question for you. Um, the survey that you referred to that, that has only just come out, so, so great timing. Um, mention that the um, there's a, a lot of people who don't know what's in their KiwiSaver accounts and kind of we knew that already um, but do you see signs that people are starting to pay more attention to uh, their savings their KiwiSaver their their retirement income is is that one of the things that you referred to coming out of the survey a little bit. Um, certainly people are more knowledgeable now about their KiwiSaver than they were at the beginning of lockdown. Um, many of you here from the industry will know the panicking that went on and the poor decision making um, <coughs> was being threatened. And most of that um, has sort of resolved itself. Um, maybe we thought afterwards, maybe they were panicking a little less than we thought and maybe they were just thinking hard. But there was certainly a misunderstanding of an investment account versus a savings account in particular. And again, don't forget, we've got a cohort of, say, 10 years who's never seen their Kiwi, their Kiwi saver balance go and do anything other than go up. So going down was a deep shock. Um, our favourite um, uh, query into the office was very mm. early on, which said, which asked us what we were going to do about the government that was taking money out of their Kiwi saver account. Um, it was that bad. Um, we think it's getting better. We think the level of investor capability is not great. It's especially poor amongst women, and I'd put myself firmly in that category. I'm learning a lot on this job, I can tell you. Um, but the more we, and it's interesting, isn't it? Because this is about behavior change mostly. And as we know about behavior change, you can put as many messages out there as you like over and over and over and over again, and people don't listen until they're ready. So I think it's incumbent on all of us <coughs> to be putting up really consistent messages a lot over time, the same messages, because sooner or later people start to clock it. Cool. Thank you very much again, Jane, and, and uh, um, we'll have to do that propping up the bar at some other stage, but I'm, I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll schedule it. And uh, it was great to have you. You started us off on exactly the right note. Um, we're going to move to a panel now. Um, so allow me to introduce uh, the panelists. Um, so first up is, is Sarah Whitelock. Uh, Sarah's a principal and leader of uh, Mercer's Consumer Wealth Business. She's responsible for overseeing Mercer's KiwiSaver, their Mercer's Super Trust, and their FlexiSaver Unit Trust. Our second panelist is, is Brian Henry. Uh, Brian's director and founder of Amana Ethical, uh, and has been a barrister for over 40 years. Uh, Amana is an ethical and Sharia uh, compliant KiwiSaver uh, scheme and unit trust. Um, third panelist is Di Papadopoulos. Uh, Di is uh, head of sales and marketing at Booster. Her focus is on mainstreaming responsible investing and helping people understand how they can make a positive impact uh, with their money. And our final panelist is Hugh Stevens. Hugh is uh, CEO of Smart Shares, uh, often going under the name of Superlife. Um, and he was previously um, head of private equity and real estate for BNP Paribas, uh, based in Paris, and before that with JP Morgan in London. So um, as you can tell, it's a, uh, it's a great, uh, great panel. And uh, we... Um, we're going to examine the issues of uh, outreach to the public. Now, I think it, it segues nicely from, from uh, uh, Jane's opening address, uh, because it's really about getting out to the public and talking to them about the issues of responsible investing, about being financially smart, uh, and, and doing so in a way that not only kind of talks to people, but really engages them. So, as we heard, many people signing up to a KiwiSaver fund or an investment fund don't know uh, exactly what fund they're signing up to, let alone what companies they're investing in. Um, 
And and uh, Money for Money's annual surveys that we do together with the Responsible Investment Association say that people want to invest ethically, um, but they don't know how to do it, or they don't have this, the right information, or they're confused. So given all of that, how can we take the message out to the public? How can we spread the word and get people to engage with this idea of investing ethically? And I'm going to start off uh, uh, with you, Sarah, um, with a question that, that maybe the rest of the panelists can also address. From your experience, what are the most resonant messages uh, for the public around investing ethically or responsibly? Uh, kia ora. <laughs> Lovely to um, be here and thank you for the introduction, Barry. Um, we think that, look, really, once you start communicating on matters that are important to people, it starts to resonate with them. And I think Jane certainly touched on that when, when she talked about what happened through the COVID um, with, with KiwiSaver balances. And recently we undertook some research and quite consistent results to what Jane has just shared with us. And that reiterates that the number one thing that KiwiSaver investors value is investment performance, but really consistent with what Jane shared, it also tells us that a growing number of people want their money invested responsibly and in line with their personal values. And our survey showed that that was almost hitting the 75% mark, saying that access to RI options was important or very important. So I think once you start combining those priorities, that's going to resonate with people. And I think the good news is that you can combine those two. You don't have to sacrifice the greater good to get the higher returns. Um, you referred already to RIA, Barry, and RIA and Morningstar data shows that RI funds can outperform mainstream funds over a number of timeframes and asset classes. Um, baked into Mercer's um, RI policy is a belief that sustainable investment approach is more likely to create and preserve long-term value, and it is in customers' best interest. So in how we make it resonate, we would say combining those messages that you don't have to sacrifice the greater good to get the higher returns is going to resonate with people. That's, uh, that's really good. I just... Uh... Uh, refreshed our website page on on that issue of of do does responsible investment earn good returns and the answer is is overwhelmingly yes and and not only uh, often better returns but but also uh, often at lower risk. Um, Hugh, from your perspective, how how do you see all of this uh, kind of working out in terms of what resonates with the public? Mm -hmm. what, what what do you find <clears throat> from your experience? Well, good evening, everyone. I, I mean, clearly, uh, our customer feedback also shows that there's a huge latent demand for sustainable investing. And I think we see this and we'll hear this from all the speakers tonight. And, and the number 75%, I'm not surprised about. Um, however, we also have to you know, recognise that I think within our book, 5% uh, of our investors uh, choose our low cost, fully sustainable funds. So there's, a, there's just a, a, an enormous gap between what people would like to do or say they would like to do and what they actually do in practice. And I suppose, so then what resonates really for us is showing, not telling. I, I think we've, as an industry, done a lot of telling over the years. You know, we, we've had decades of conferences and discussions around sustainable investing, but what really resonates is catching people at the point where they're making decisions. So uh, April was a really good moment, I suppose, to really tell the story and to, and to actually help people make uh, changes because I suppose many sustainable funds uh, performed extremely well through the market volatility of March uh, and April. And it really demonstrated exactly what Sarah was saying, which is you don't have to give up performance. In fact, you can quite often gain performance and investors in ethical funds did gain performance through the, the COVID volatility period. Um, so let's, uh, I suppose for us, it's, it's, it's not necessarily about research and telling a story. It's more about um, showing people um, that people who have made the change have actually done quite well out of it. Mm, good. Yep, consistent theme there. Brian, uh, what, what, what's your experience and, and Amana's experience? Amana's experience is a bit different to everybody else because we have a strict ethical mandate. And the first thing our clients look for is the fact you're going to meet that mandate and comply. 
they also look for performance because without performance, the mandate's not, not very useful. We outperform the market by basically 15 to whatever percent. We did 24% to 31st March, give or take on tax. So our position is that our clients want strict application of the mandate and they also like to think we can get performance, which we've done and delivered. And the delivery of the two together is incredibly important. And for us, that's our focus. And we put us number one, complying with our ethical mandate. And that is absolutely important. And it's what drives people to come and join you because they do think about ethics. They do think about the greater good. Uh, unlike everybody else, we don't do money lending or interest-based products, which makes us very different. But the key always is performance, and we've performed. Cool, cool. Thank you. Um, Di, uh, Boost has been one of the pioneers in ethical investing in New Zealand. Uh, I think you guys have, have kind of been pretty much in, in it since, uh, uh, since it, it kind of started as a sector. Um, what have you found as, uh, uh, from Booster's experience? Thanks, Barry. Well, I guess um, th that's changed over time. As you say, we've been doing this for, for quite some time now. And in those early days, um, we definitely saw a lot of, of what the other panelists, panelists have spoken about, where, you know, will I return, uh, sacrifice returns was a really key concern. Um, and so what we tended to find was that the people that would engage with our um, RI funds tended to be those that, you know, were incredibly led by their values um, and those that maybe had an interest, um, but, but were a little bit uncertain or maybe less hardcore, so to speak, um, were pretty hesitant. Now, over time, we've actually really seen that start to fall away. And I guess that comes with, you know, the evidence base, which is built um, over the years, which shows that you're not going to sacrifice returns um, and, you know, experiences of this year, where that's been incredibly, um, I think, visible in the media as well. Um, <clears throat> where we are really now starting to see our members um, becoming more engaged is around this idea of um, how much ethical investing, um, you know, gives power to the people. Um, and, you know, there's um, a lot of people who have got, you know, relatively small balances sitting in their KiwiSaver accounts. And, you know, there's this feeling of, well, if, if, you know, if money is power and I don't really have a lot sitting there, you know, how can I affect change? So a lot of the conversations we're having right now is more around the fact that, you know, collectively by coming together and investing in an ethical way, you can affect change regardless of whether you've only just started and you've got $200 to your name, or you've got a portfolio of several hundred thousand dollars, and that it's really a way of, I guess, um, democratizing people's ability to to um, to be a positive, um, you know, force for good, and to to have a voice where perhaps they might not have um, felt they did before. Okay, cool. It's nice, uh, nice to to have that sort of empowerment thing. The uh, um, the the sort of related issue is about who's interested, and. Uh, I referred to the survey that, that Mindful Money does, we, we do annual surveys, and what we found quite surprisingly was that it wasn't actually millennials who are driving kind of the change to ethical investing. It was as much a commitment by older people as well. And uh, so that surprised us, because if you read the international literature, a lot of it says, well, you know, it's all the millennials who, who want to be ethical. Are you finding from your experience that your customers who are calling for this and who are opting into the ethical products or, or the ethical approaches are more likely to be young or old or, or any age or any characteristics? What kind of audiences is this uh, appealing to? Hugh, do you want to kick us off on that? Yeah, that's, um, I mean, it's really uh, an interesting question and quite often the answer is anti-intuitive, like you say. Um, you know, um, but I, I'm looking at a graph in front of me right now, which is our uh, our, our investor demographics, I suppose, as of today. And uh, what's really interesting, and it shows exactly what you're talking about, Barry. So uh, up to about 17 or 18, then there's quite a high proportion of investors in ethical and SRI funds. Um, but then from about 1920, it drops right off, you know, right down. And, and then there's a steady climb back up again, 
people up until their 50s are still sort of mid levels, but then it just takes off again at 65 and then really mm. peaks in the, in the 70s. So, um, you know, you, you it's 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 bimodal or uh, if you want to call yep. it that. Um, but what that really shows is, you know, there's a number of messages in there. And one of them is that it's really important um, when you're thinking about uh, friends and family and other people that actually it's quite often when you're recommending things to other people that you'll make the difference. And, and so, you know, where we see children's accounts, often those children's accounts, are, uh, children's accounts are put into ethical investment. Um, the other thing that's really interesting in the data is looking at it by location as well. And, um, you know, in terms of our leaderboard, uh, we have Dunedin and Wellington as, as the leaders on 14%. Um, Christchurch is kind of in the middle around 10 at 10% and then the Aucklanders I'm sorry to say are trailing on about 7% so um, maybe the answer is to actually go to uh, uh, where people sort of are picking these things up a little bit quicker and, and get a real groundswell going there and then sort of back into into the the, the laggard um, sort of uh, cities after that yeah there we go that's our data. <laughs> it's really a good reminder for the financial sector that tends to be so Auckland centric. So, uh, um, Sarah, what what uh, are you guys are you seeing the same kind of trends with audiences? Oh, well, interestingly, a lot of our um, data that we're seeing is quite consistent to what Jane shared. So, I'm wondering if we're talking to the same people there. But as I mentioned earlier, look, our research overall is sh certainly showing that the number of investors who want their money invested responsibly and in line with their personal values is growing. Um, certainly we're finding that there is a bit more of a skew towards females, um, as Jane said. So women um, in our research are more likely to have responsible investment in their top five compared to men. And we are finding a bit more of a skew towards um, the under 40s. So the importance of RI to them is going up above 75%, heading towards 80%, whereas in the general population, it's, it's just kind of below 75 <laughs> I think what I find interesting though is not just the what's important, but how do you reach out to those people and how do you communicate to people about RI? Um, I think it's really important that we provide investors and KiwiSaver, I mean, we're talking a lot about KiwiSaver, but it's broader than that, but with clear messages about responsible investment across multiple channels. And I think not surprisingly, the channels that you need to use change over time. So really interesting in the research we just did, we surveyed people back in 2009 and things like social media didn't resonate at all. Whereas now a third of people are saying using, you know, that, that channel is either very important or important to them. And when you look at under 40 year olds, that rises up to almost 40%. But there's still an expectation from these people that they want to get information from employers, advisors, helplines, websites. It's all important. Um, for them getting information and making good decisions. So I think we as an industry have to be able to reach out via all those channels. And the other thing we found in our research was really important. I talked before that investment performance kind of was top of the pops. Sitting under that in terms of importance was people getting easy to use and easy to understand material. So I think it's about seeing how people get their information on what responsible investment is and then making it really easy to understand because it is confusing and we need to communicate in a clear, concise way. Yeah, it's a really good point, isn't it? Because mm -hmm. uh, we tend to use far too many acronyms and terminology mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. so on. Di, uh, what's, what's uh, Booster's profile, audience profile look like? And yeah, so I guess uh, mirroring some of the earlier comments, mm -hmm. yeah you hear the, the common rhetoric that it, it's all about the millennials, um, but since day dot for us, it's women in their late 30s and early 40s um, who are our most um, common um, responsible investor. I think there's a um, interesting difference in terms of what the triggers are between the different groups. So when we look to our millennial type client, the thing that will tend to trigger action for that group is referral by a friend. So they've got a friend that is, you know, interested in the space and they've heard about it. There's been some, you know, um, Friday night discussions and that triggers the action. Whereas with the biggest portion of our membership are actually taking more action, which is those ladies in their 30s and 40s, 
it's actually from um, our research and talking to our clients around um, the <coughs> unit. So as people start to have children and they start to grow, and you know, I think many parents out there would um, understand this, you do start to think about what that world is going to look like for these little people you know, as time goes on. Um, and so for those people, that's what's really triggering that action. And I think that's also why we see more action from them is because it's a very um, clear and constant reminder when you've got those little faces at looking at you at the dinner table every night um, that you want this world to be a better place for them in the future. And so I think that's what's driving that behavior. Cool. That's, uh, that's really interesting. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, Brian. We, we, we've got a bit of a different perspective. We brought on a director last year who was one of the originators of impact investing in the United Kingdom. Impact investing is about people who want to create change. We're about ethical investing, which is people who know what's right and want to do what's right with their investment money. So the market we hunt for is people who understand what is right and wrong. Our big difference, of course, is we don't do money lending. So we're seeking quite a different market to what I'm hearing from uh, my friends who are talking tonight. And to us, what is important is reaching out to people who actually understand things they think are right and wrong, and that's where they want to go. Is that impact investing? Yes, it is in a way, but their motivation is to be inside something that's ethical with a mandate they can clearly see, clearly understand, and that's what they want to do. We started in 2014. We've been an ethical fund from day one. That's all we've ever done. But the whole key is to have a clear, concise mandate people can look at and say, yes, we like that. No, we don't like that. And we have found huge support so long as you can say, this is what we do. This is our performance. And it's totally right. Everybody wants performance inside the mandate. So for us, it's a combination of the two things. And your next question leads into this, and I'll leave it till that question comes. Cool, cool. You've, uh, uh, you've rumbled my next question. And, and the next question is, is kind of around, uh, so how does the public know what to trust in all of this? Because they hear the terms ethical or responsible, everyone <laughs> and they, they hear this. ESG, uh, environment, social governance, you know, the, everyone's doing it. And, and it's very hard for them to know who's actually really doing it and who's just talking about it. And um, so it's one of the things that, that uh, uh, in a way, Mindful Money was set up to do, to try and, and give some, some uh, standards uh, around this and some, some benchmarks. But, but from your perspective, do you think there's a problem? Um, do you think there's a problem with, with the public not really knowing who to trust, what to trust? You know, kind of, I, I guess, you know, that the FMA is, has started an inquiry about claims of, of ethical investing that may not be substantiated. What, what do you think is, is the issue here? You know, how, how can people get a sense that, that this, is, this is real and credible and will make a difference? Uh, Di, do you want to kick us off? Sure thing. So um, I think there's a responsibility on all of us within the industry um, to help to increase, I think, at first, just base level understanding. So, you know, all being you know, deeply ingrained in this, we toss around terms like RI, SRI, ethical, and we know what we're talking about. However, for a whole group of people out there, those terms could mean absolutely nothing or they could be completely interchangeable. So, so what, what does that mean? So at Booster, you know, we try to make sure that within all of our content and within all of our channels, we are helping to educate and provide people with really simple and easy to understand explanations of what the space actually looks like. So when they are getting into a particular fund, they understand what the mandate of that fund is and what it's actually trying to achieve. And I think that the industry as a whole needs to do probably a better job of making sure that if they're going to label a fund something, that they are also supporting that with really good content, which explains what that actually means. Um, that said, if I look at our journey of you know, where we've come to today, between the certification provided by RIA and now having mindful money in the market providing a whole other level of transparency. I think we've actually got some really great building blocks there in terms of building that credibility and that understanding from an independent point of view. 
Cool, cool. Brian, you you carry on where you were where you left we, off. We've got very strong views on this. Point one: you have to have a written explicit mandate as to whether you're green, ethical, responsible, as to what that means. And investors have to be able to see that. If they don't, you're misleading the market. Green, ethical, responsible are nebulous words. From day one, we've had a written, specific ethical mandate. The mandate has to have consequences if you breach it, which means if you breach the mandate, what are you gonna do about it? Well, the answer is we actually purify any money that we make in breach of the mandate. So you actually stick by your ethics and you stick by a consequence if you breach your ethics. The next thing is that under the FMC, if you say you're ethical and you don't tell people what it means, you're actually misleading them. They have to be able to read it, clearly understand it. Same if it's green, same if it's responsible. So if you don't have a document that sets out, I believe in one page, what your mandate is, then you're not actually doing your job when you sell to your customers. I was involved with the guys who developed ESG, Environment Social Governance. It's great to say I've got an ESG this or that, but if it's all governance, then you've forgotten environment and social. That is misleading the market. ESG is a marketing tool, full stop. Anybody applying an ESG mandate has got to say, this is our mandate. One document that you can read. And if you don't have that, as far as I'm concerned, the FMA should be looking at you very, very seriously. Day one, we published our mandate and we have stuck to that mandate. If we breach it, it costs us money. And our investors expect nothing different because as I said, the people who believe in ethics. Cool, thank you. Sarah. Oh, I just really um, agree, Barry, with some of the points you made. I think part of the issue too with trust and confidence is I think, and Di, you touched on it as well, it is quite confusing. And I agree, things like there are so many labels and we've all used quite a few of them already. We've talked about RI, sustainability. Brian's just talked about ESG. We can talk about SRI. We can talk about negative screens, positive screens, and we could go on and on. And I think... As Di said, cutting through some of that confusion can't but help with trust and, and confidence. Um, going back to, you know, you mentioned um, RIA, Di, um, we think independent certification is helpful. It's a key reason we sought that early adoption of the RIA Responsible Investment Certification a number of years ago for all of our um, KiwiSaver funds. I think We've got to provide messages that are just really simple, that are clear and concise. I think if there is labelling, it needs to be applied consistently across the board so there isn't confusion or that at least there's less confusion for investors. Um, we probably wouldn't want a labelling system that just focuses on one part of that, that ESG process, a bit like what Brian was talking about, for example, say just labelling on exclusions because we think it's just so much more than that. Um, it's about having an opportunity to invest sustainably, to for investors to be able to use their voice through things like proxy voting. And so um, we think you need to be engaging that ESG right through the process and reporting back to people. And I think to sum it up, I would say as an industry, we should acknowledge it's confusing. We should cut through it with simple and clear messaging. And I think there probably is a place for some type of um, certification if it's applied consistently. Cool. Thank you. Q. Look, I, th I think uh, I support the comments of, of the other panellists. And um, I would, I suppose, draw out two points, really. The first is, as many others have talked about, there is a lot of complexity here. But I, I would also point out that this is, you know, very early in in the development of of this um, this product, I suppose, if we want to call it that, and uh, and we shouldn't beat ourselves up too much. This is actually a really valuable phase in product development uh, and the development of a market where people are are exploring different ways of doing things, and we need that creativity and that innovation going on, and people coming up with different uh, ways of expressing 
their sustainable investment style and then a good debate. And so we'll end up knocking out the, the, the fakers, I suppose, and the, the less uh, sustainable and the less useful products and, and the, the, the good products will rise to the top. So let's embrace this uh, innovation phase. Um, you know, with, with um, five to 15% to, to, to of investors actually engaging, you know, we're in the early adopter phase and those people are highly engaged. They want to help us uh, develop really good solutions. They're prepared to put up with a little bit more complexity than maybe the mainstream will be uh, who follow. You know, when we want to capture that 75%, we're going to have to be a lot more straightforward, but let's not um, forget the value of this, this early innovation phase. So I, I would say celebrate what's going on right now rather than, um, you know, um, worry about it. Uh, the other thing is, I suppose, uh, trust is, is, is built on transparency. And, uh, you know, I, I think still too many products, it's still too hard to find out what is in them. And, um, and so our business, you know, we're in the business of, of issuing exchange traded funds as well, which uh, is, a, is a huge groundswell across the world, uh, you know, alongside the sustainable investment move. And um, the ETF products are just perfectly designed for transparency because they publish their holdings every day uh, and, um, and they're built on an index which is publicly available as well. So, um, so I think you know, that there are new structures coming out, low cost, uh, transparent structures that will um, be the vehicle on which um, sustainable investing can move to the next level, I would say. So, you know, we've put out our, our ESG uh, exchange traded funds. They're listed on the NZX, and it will be just interesting to see how that um, gets picked up over time. But transparency and embracing innovation, that would be the two points for me. Mm. Nice. Good discussion. Thank you all. That's, Gary, uh, Gary I think can, can, can yeah. I just clarify something? Jane made a, sorry, Karen made a really good point about mandates. Mandates aren't not just what you don't do. Mandates are what you do do. And that is the most important part of a mandate. The mandate has to say, this is what we actually do. Yeah, this is what we don't do, but what you do do is the most important part of a mandate. Yeah. And I think those, those elements of, of having a mandate and a, a clear policy that is published and, and you're held to, you're accountable to is, is really important. Uh, I think that the fact that you have some visible standards and some some transparency about about those, I think, you know, one of the things that Mindful Money does by telling people what's in their their portfolios is actually as well as ETFs, as as Hugh said, we're trying to do that across all Kiwi Saver funds and all uh, investment funds. So I think that transparency helps the simplicity of message and being able to engage people with with what it is you're trying to do is, is important. I think there's one other element that, that actually has just come up in a question. And Jason says, you know, does it, all of this make any difference? So how does it make a difference to the environment? So if you do this, if you are investing ethically, where do you see the changes? Where do you see the impact coming? Oh, good question. Yeah, may I jump on yeah. that one if I, uh, I'm Go for it. speaking out of turn, maybe. But look, I, I, I think that's a really good question. And, and that comes back to some of the points earlier about making the information available in a really digestible format. But, um, you know, one, one graph I have in front of me uh, here um, is, uh, is looking at the greenhouse gas emission intensity from a, uh, in this case, a dimensional global bond sustainability trust, which is one of the, the, the components of our ethical fund. And what it shows is that against the index, so if you bought all of the, 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 uh, the, the global bonds, I suppose, that would normally be in a global bond portfolio, uh, and then instead of that, you optimize towards um, debt from companies and supported the balance sheets of companies that are reducing their um, greenhouse gas emissions, then this this fund shows that at the moment they, they, they're expressing a 92% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. So effectively they are saying we will lend to companies that give the same return but with 92% reduction in, um, in emissions. So that that's, you know, it is measurable, these things. Um, and, uh, you know, particularly companies that cannot access debt capital can't grow as fast. Um, you know, companies that can't access capital can't grow as fast as those that have a lower cost of capital. So that's 
I suppose the mission of what we're doing here is to try and lower the cost of capital for sustainable companies. Um, and I suppose the counterpoint is that the cost of capital for non-sustainable companies is, then is higher and it makes them less competitive over time. So, you know, it is measurable. Um, it's available in this dimensional report, which, um, you know, is, um, is one of the components of the Ethica Fund. Cool. Barry, if I, if I can come in on that. Yeah. A, cl a classic example is, okay, do you invest in airlines? Airlines can have green fuel, dirty fuel, who cares what fuel? They drop it at 35,000 feet in the atmosphere. We don't invest in airlines, haven't since inception. Uh, the answer is simple. It's if you don't invest in airlines, then that form of pollution is stopped. Yep. Okay. Sarah. Oh, yeah. Who wants to go? Sarah? Oh, I haven't really got anything to add to that, um, Barry. I think Hugh's covered that off really well, and um, Brian something as well. Yeah, if, if I might just add, Barry, just to, um, I think, carry on, I think Hugh covered really well in terms of the, the evidence that's out there. I think the other thing that we all need to be mindful of hmm. is that this isn't, uh, that this is a long game. So this yeah. is that happens overnight and so I think that that's the other thing that you, you know I know it sounds like we're saying take it on faith but but we can already see the impacts there but actually to get the full impact of this movement it does take time and it does take more people getting on board um, and so it's demonstrable already that it has an effect but it is a long game and it will only be over the course of you know many years to come that we will see the full impact of that as more and more people get behind it. Yeah, and I think it has a couple of dimensions. One is, is you gain a benefit from not investing in bad companies who, you know, emit fossil fuels or, or do bad things to the environment or human rights. So in a way, you're getting out of the, the companies that are doing harm. And then the other side, you're actually influencing companies to improve their performance. And I think that one, the improving the performance, is kind of where it's quite hard to show the impact uh, because it's much easier to say we've got no fossil fuels or, or you know we don't support companies that test their products on animals but if you're if you're saying we're actually shifting companies to do better things and, and to behave better then you have to show that improvement and, and that's always hard to do is 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 that your experience that, that you know, if, you, if you're going to be required to show impact, it's, it's sometimes not easy. Barry, the providers of capital in the end control where the world market goes. It's that yeah. simple. It's that simple. Uh-huh. And, and they exercise influence over companies because they are typically the governors. No, they're, not, they're, not, they're, not, they're, not, not in the shareholders. They can, they can actually control by not providing capital. It's more an influence they can actually control. Hmm. That's capitalism. That's what it means. Hmm. Sarah, what about Mercer? Because you guys spend a lot of time engaging with companies and, and working on trying to improve their performance. Do you, do you yeah. see it's possible for you to have metrics without uh, sort of with, without naming and shaming particular companies about who you've improved and who you haven't? Yeah, well, I mean, we're certainly working, um, as I said, right through that process. So things like ESG ratings um, for all of the managers we use, proxy voting, which is all publicly available. Um, but back to your point about, you know, the difference, I guess, between um, exclusions and positive investing, or if you want, I kind of liken it a bit to um, Karen, um, sorry, Jane talked earlier about having children. I live in a house of teenagers at the moment, which is a joy. But, you know, you have some things in your family that are your not negotiables, but you also go while they're in your house, you're wanting to really work with them about their behaviour. So once they get out of your house, they are contributing so successfully to society so I guess that's part of our approach as well and we'd see that proxy voting and that engaging with companies about things carbon is a good example you know if you look at that long term the ones that are going to keep being heavy in that it's not going to be successful as a long term trend so working with them investing more in the ones that are, are looking for um, reduction carbon going forward. 
Okay, I think we're going to have to wrap it up there. So, so thank you all very much. That was a really interesting panel, and I appreciate it very much. So, thank you, Brian and Hugh and Sarah and Di for participating. Thank you all. Thank, thank you all. You cool. Thank you. So, um, that was some great ideas for for, for reaching out to the public. Um, I thought I'd just say a few words about what Mindful Money is doing on these issues. As we said, we were founded in order to provide a, a, what we call radical transparency. So, so we're showing people what's in their, their KiwiSaver portfolio or investment fund portfolio. And, and it's not only what's, what people directly invest in, what the funds directly invest in, but it's in the funds that they invest in. So, so the indirect investments that they've got in ETFs or, or, or funds or portfolios. So, so this is a kind of complete view of what people invest in and then we relate it to issues that the public are concerned about. We started off a year ago with uh, looking at 280 KiwiSaver funds and the information has been on our website and a growing number of people go onto our website, look at the information and then they switch to a more ethical KiwiSaver. Uh, a lot of them, uh, uh, use our research and do it separately, but the ones who use our website to do that uh, have switched so far around $10 million and we're setting a target for that to increase to 50 million um, and uh, in a year's time. And, and that's kind of a, a good measure for us because um, we know that the impact of that is many multiple times in terms of, of the indirect influence over, over consumers. Um, just recently, in the, in the last uh, uh, two weeks, we've, we've added now retail investment funds. So all of these non-KiwiSaver investment funds, uh, we've now put that information up on our website so you can go and look at our brand new website uh, and have a look at uh, all of that information on those 390 investment funds. Um, and it's entirely free, uh, which is uh, a great thing we can do as a charity. So our challenge is, is to get a critical mass of people to know enough about ethical investing to actually invest mindfully or responsibly. Um, and this is going to then influence the industry uh, and start to push along the spectrum towards more of a, a positive impact. We're putting this uh, outreach campaign uh, in place, um, but we've also launched a, a fund fundraising drive in order to do so. Uh, it's a Pledge Me campaign. Uh, it's on uh, a crowdfunding site, the Pledge Me site. Uh, we've just put in chat on Zoom and I guess in, in Facebook uh, where you can go to find out about that. Uh, but if anyone here wants to support us, uh, that's a really good place to start supporting mindful money. So um, thanks for that. Um, uh, a, uh, a plug for uh, our crowdfunding campaign. Um, when when I set up mindful money, one of the motivations uh, was actually about climate change. Um, it was about how we can use investment really to drive change and. I've been involved in this for a long time, since 1990, I've been involved internationally in UN negotiations, in work in the Pacific, in New Zealand. Um, and, you know, I've become increasingly uh, convinced that actually this problem cannot be solved without using economic levers. And those economic levers can't be solved without the finance system actually being central. Um, and so, you know, what we need to do is we need to direct the, the finance system to be able to provide funding for alternatives to our fossil fuel en energy system, not only directly through the explorers and producers of it, but throughout the economy, to all of those uh, uses of, of, uh, of fossil fuels as well. So this is a, a kind of a challenge for saying, so how can we use this investment system in order to take powerful action on climate change? So we've got a great panel uh, to discuss this. Um, and we are joined tonight 
uh, by uh, three panelists. So, so let me introduce them one by one. So uh, first, John Berry. Um, John uh, has, is the uh, co-founder and CEO of uh, Pathfinder Asset Management, which is uh, also uh, the parent company for CareSaver, QBSaver. John's had 20 plus years experience in law firms and investment banks, uh, founded, uh, co-founded uh, Pathfinder in 2009, and he's a board member of Men's Health Trust and uh, Punakaiki uh, Fund, private equity fund. Welcome, John. Uh, Rebecca Swan. Um, Rebecca is uh, an ESG, uh, Environment Social Governance Specialist, and head of uh, product for AMP Capital. She's worked in fund management for over 23 years, um, and she looks so young. <laughs> Uh, she's uh, involved in, in uh, uh, supporting a number of not-for-profits, uh, including Women in Super, Good Registry, and the Kina mm -hmm. Foundation. I welcome Rebecca. Mm -hmm. uh, Sam Stumps is a founder of Simplicity, probably needs very little introduction to anyone. Uh, he was previously CEO of Tower Investments, uh, formerly Managing Director of Hanover Group and spent 10 years working for Goldman Sachs in London and Hong Kong. So warm welcome, Sam. Very great. So for all of you, you know, our problem is that trillions of dollars have been spent in investing in fossil fuel exploration and production. Our planet is burning. Uh, the campaign for divestment's got a, a nice simple proposition, which is switch your funding into clean energy instead save the climate and avoid huge risks from fossil fuels? Is divestment the right approach? Or are there other things that investment managers should also be doing in order to take action uh, for the sake of the climate? Um, so John, lead us off. Um, kia ora, Barry and everyone. Um, I, I think with fundamentally with fund managers, it's actually no different to any other business in terms of um, how we can have a huge impact. And I think the first thing that we need to do as a business is um, actually frame and, and define what we believe around climate change. Like, do we believe climate change is the biggest challenge for our children and future generations? Do we believe we need to move to a low carbon or zero carbon um, future? You know, like the Ford Motor Company does, like BP does, like airlines do. Does your business believe that as well? Um, or does your business believe something else? And so first thing is define what you believe as a business. Second thing is communicate that. So as fund managers, we need to communicate it to our investors, but also communicate to, to staff. And I'm not talking about fund management businesses here, but any business, you know, imagine the CEO one day comes in on a Monday and says, what our marketing department's been talking about with climate change, it, it's real. And, and we need to deal with that with the, our product range and how we deal with consumers and how we plan for the future. Um, that changes the DNA of a business. Um, so communication is, is really, really important. And, and thirdly, just thinking about resourcing. So um, does the business, whether it's a fund manager or another business, have the resource and needs to think about climate change? We've hired an environmental scientist several years ago on our team, and Kate doesn't have a financial background, but she brings amazing analysis of environmental issues and is a key part of our decision-making around what companies we go invest in um, and also around sustainability issues for the business. So again, in a resource. So to answer your question, what can fund managers do? Same as any business, define your purpose, communicate it, and make sure you're resourced for it to implement. Thank you, John. Uh, Rebecca. Great, thank you. Um, and thanks, John. Um, my thoughts aren't too dissimilar to John's, but essentially, um, I agree, you've absolutely got to have a clear policy around what your beliefs are around climate change, um, and be really transparent about that to your all your stakeholders, staff, board, um, and investors. Um, and the other thing that you've got to do is also have some really clear priority areas with regards to your policy, like be really clear about what you're focusing on and what those beliefs are. So whether it's a transition to a low carbon economy, whether you're looking to reduce um, emissions, um, whether you're aligning to, aligning to the Paris targets. Um, and then I think the next aspect is probably around measurement. So, you know, there's that old saying, you know, what gets measured gets done. So another really clear, for, uh, powerful action that investors can do is to have um, targets around funds and report on those to your investors regularly. Um, and so you can show your pro progress. And uh, Hugh touched on this in the earlier panel, but one of the ways that we do this is around carbon footprinting. 
and we've been doing it for over 10 years now. Um, it's a bit of a blunt measure, but what it does allow us to do is compare the carbon emissions in a, in, in a fund versus its benchmark year on year. So we can see how we're tracking towards our targets um, and those lower uh, carbon emissions as well. Um, it's a big job though, so we only do it once a year, once a year, but it's a great way of showing that to our investors and also for ourselves. And also it's a good engagement tool as well. Engagement's also really important. So being an active owner um, with regards to the companies that we own and engaging on these issues, <coughs> being transparent around our proxy voting um, as well. And um, you know, whether that's direct engagement with companies or collaborative engagements through the Climate Action 100, um, also integrating uh, TCFD reporting as well into our analysis, which is the task force for climate related disclosure. Um, so that sort of gives you an idea of, you know, some of the things that we think are important. Okay, we'll come back to a couple of those issues in, in, uh, in further discussion. Sam, what, uh, what's your perspective? Oh, g'day, Barry. Look, I think there's two things. Let's call it micro and macro. So the micro thing, which is what you, can you do within New Zealand, you won't be surprised to hear me say that you should just draw attention to every single person who has their money with a bank-owned KiwiSaver that they are investing in fossil fuels. In fact, you know, maybe we should just get a billboard that says the ANZ KiwiSaver invests in fossil fuels. I've, I've been through their exclusion policies, just had a look prior to this meeting. Sure enough, they're all conspicuously silent on this. So all the noise that they may make about environmental and climate change, they're still happily piling their members' money into it and providing them banking services and lending services and so on. So if you think about it at a micro level, the single biggest thing we can do to contribute to um, this problem is to make sure that these companies aren't funded. You know, you start a company of capital and it under it underperforms and it just doesn't invest. And if it doesn't invest, it doesn't extract and burn and do all that sort of stuff. So that's at the micro level. And then I think at the macro level, I think the local fund managers in New Zealand just got to get real about what change they can actually affect. It, it's a great marketing story um, that, you know, we don't invest in this or do invest in this or whatever, but how can you affect change in a global level? Because the environment's a global issue. And so that's, you know, one of the reasons why we, amongst other uh, members, outsource the international management to companies that agitate on this and also invest in funds that deliberately exclude it. So, and in fact, I think a handful of people on this call here have been involved in setting up, you know, Vanguard funds that are exclusionary and are massive and will actually get the attention of the BPs, the Exxons, and you know, whoever, because it ain't going to happen by a New Zealand manager knocking on the door and saying, excuse me, I object to your climate policy. But when Vanguard or BlackRock or State Street do it, they have to listen, because collectively, these companies own a good 30% on average of their stock. So I think that, you know, in terms at the macro level, we've got to get serious about helping what's already occurring overseas by putting our money with those people who are the serious advocates, because we aren't. And then at the micro level, you know, let's draw attention to the fact that 80% of Kiwi savers are still invested, probably unintentionally and completely unknowingly, are still invested in Kiwi saver funds, which invest in the destruction of the environment, because it suits their bank shareholders and it suits their profitability profile to do so. Okay. Simple. Really. You, you, you're right about the number of people who invest in, in those funds. We, uh, we've just done some numbers to say that there's $961 million of KiwiSaver funds uh, invested in fossil fuels and $623 million uh, in other managed investment funds. So it's a very, it's a very big number. If, if they're all in, in great companies that were charging ahead with renewable energy at a rapid rate, uh, we wouldn't be so worried. But actually, if you look at which companies they are, uh, then uh, typically it's the Exxon Mobiles of this world rather than uh, than the progressive companies. And if you don't mind me getting an angry hat on here for a second, Barry, just look at the ANZ, for example, because it's so disingenuous. You read their exclusions policy, they actually make a virtue of all the things they don't exclude. They conspicuously uh, emit, uh, omit fossil fuels. There's no mention of the fact that they actually invest in fossil fuels. They just do this very long thing about all the things they won't invest in and, you know, it's a lot of virtue signaling in many cases going on there. And yet if they were, you know, they will profess to stand up and say that they're serious about the environment. You'll see all the, the standard bank ads on this. And when it, when it actually comes to it, when it comes to the business of making money or not making money or getting serious about it, they're, they're nowhere. So it's the same with, with Westpac as well. You know, anyway, it's, it's, it's bad. 
So, so Sam referred to sort of the, uh, gaining power to, to be able to influence these companies at a global level. Rebecca, AMP Capital is obviously part of a number of coalitions uh, that are able to influence the big companies with the power of the investment dollar. And we've seen lots of, of groupings of those investors coming together, IGCC, the, the recent Going for Zero coalition, where they're trying to drive uh, emissions down to zero. How does AMP Capital work with, with those groups? Are you part of, of coalitions to do that? Is it, uh, does it take place at an international level? How does all of that work for you guys? Yeah, great. Thanks, Barry. Um, so we are involved from an, I'll talk about it from an environmental point of view, but we are involved in a lot of those groups. And um, so we are a, we're a founding member of the Investor Group for Climate Change. And Dr. Ian Woods, who's part of our team, who has a PhD in climate change, actually is, has been the deputy chair and has been the chair for quite some time in that organization. In 2017, we joined the Climate Action 100 initiative. Um, and that's really an opportunity for, I think it's about 45 investors globally who make up about $40 trillion worth of investments where they are sharing the lead on engaging on these um, 100 largest emitters in the world. So um, AMP Capital actually leads the engagement with BHP and West Farmers. And actually it was announced, I think it was late last week um, or early this week, around that that engagement has actually had um, really, really um, successful outcome with BHP. So along with um, the co-lead investors and other members of the Climate Action 100 and support of the IGCC um, following an intensive consultation, um, BHP announced uh, that they strengthened their industry association by stating that they're gonna work with their lobby groups to establish public standards and plans for how and what they will advocate on by the end of 2020. And they're gonna monitor all of their activities in real time for consistency with BHP's own positions. So while they've outlined, they've also outlined their new global uh, climate policy standards, um, which serve and give show the clear direction on the company's expectations of the industry associations lobbying on climate policy. So, so while it may not seem like too much, it's actually like a massive step, um, and a lot of work has gone into that. Um, and and I think one of the things that you've got to think about climate is also um, investment risk. And so while it's our view that it's sensible to transition to a low carbon economy as quickly as possible, you know, we started our approach in 2005 and it's evolved um, over time. In 2014, it became more a specific, sorry, it's specific policy. In 2019, that was tightened up again. And this year, we're in the process of um, taking another leap forward, which, will be, which is really exciting. Um, and that's sort of in the approval process at the moment. Um, but it's, it's, you know, we have that transition and we've had that evolution of our policy, um, acknowledging that things like metallurgical coal, you know, are essential for steel making. Um, and there's so many industries, economies, um, and countries that are reliant on steel. Um, and at the moment, there's no uh, replacement, you know, input into that process that could replace so, so, so that that risk of of, of climate change uh, before before coming on to the conference, I uh, I took a look, look at the figures for the oil and gas index uh, over uh, the past five years, and it's uh, it, it's dropped in the value of companies by sixty three percent over the past five years. So, so John as kind of care saver and pathfinder has done a, a sort of job of completely uh, divesting from fossil fuels. Uh, do you think it's helped your performance? Yeah. Not, yeah. not, to, be, not to be in fossil fuels, you know, because you've, yeah. uh, you know, it's kind of one thing to, to sort of say, well, you've avoided uh, that plummeting uh, share price of, of the fossil fuel industry. Do you see that at a portfolio level? Yeah, um, absolutely, Barry. I mean, the, if you look at the last five years, um, tobacco, fossil fuels have actually been a really bad place to um, to have your money. Um, and and I suppose for us, it's two things. One is is um, what do we want to exclude, 
and and the other is where do you put your money and and investing into positive themes and sustainable themes and and you know when you talk about returns if we look at ETFs in the US this year the coal ETF is down 24% oil and gas mm -hmm. down 35 so avoiding the bad stuff and then if you focus money into um, into renewables, um, solar up 70%, wind up 20 and, and if I look at the clean tech ETFs, and there's quite a few of them, they range between plus 40 and plus 60%. So, um, it, you know, it's been a great move avoiding fossil fuels and and going into um, and going into renewables. Um, and and for us, a lot of it is is really just thinking, um, extending the time horizon that investors use rather than thinking about the next quarter or the next year. It's actually thinking about the next five years, the next decade. And when you do that, you start. You have to take into account the risk of stranded assets, um, the risk, the transition risk for business, and the capital costs they're, they're going to have in that transition. And you've got to factor that in as well. And, and you know, on that analysis, you avoid fossil fuels. You go into renewables. So this is kind of echoing the theme from the last panel to say it's not a bad idea financially. In fact, it can be very advantageous financially to have a more ethical portfolio. And I think Sam, when you put in your ethical mandate for, for simplicity, you did ran some numbers and found that it, uh, uh, that it was a positive for you to, to put in those ethical exclusions. Yeah, we did a lot of back testing. So basically, if you went back more than five years, uh, it was a sort of an unproven concept at that point. It was the data is pretty, pretty mixed. But in the last five years, for some of the reasons John said, absolutely. Uh, it's made sense and our portfolios are all up a half to one and a half percent per annum as a consequence of the exclusions and an awful lot of that is a fossil fuel uh, there as well. So it, 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 for the last five years, it's been a no brainer. And if you have a look at, you know, the typical sunset sunrise industry scenarios as they play out, it's pretty clear that, you know, fossil fuels kind of going the, the way of buggy whips you know, in the 19th century. So there's just going to be a very long, powerful trend against it. Starvation of capital will be one. Consumer behavior will be second. And alternative technologies will be third. So all of those things are lining up again. <clears throat> very, very hard to see what makes sense. In fact, I'm so kind of flabbergasted as to why an asset manager now would consider it any other way of managing money. I yeah. would consider it basically just laziness. Uh, it, it, it's just so obvious, you know, it, but, but anyway, but, you know, some do, some do. On that issue about buggies and, and whips, I remember the uh, Saudi foreign minister saying mm. the Stone Age didn't end because of a lack of stones and the mm. Oil Age won't end because of a lack of oil. And uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, I think we're seeing the end game. Uh, and, and, and the ultimate irony, isn't there? Never has there been more discovered oil and gas in the world. Yeah. Never has there yeah. been? Never has there been such a horrible investment. Yeah. yeah. So um, it, it kind of brings us on to the to the role of government on all of this. So one of the the government's kind of pinning its uh, hopes on on investment influence into the provision of more information. And Rebecca early on uh, referred to the TCFD. Uh, the Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosure, which Michael Bloomberg has been, has been championing, which will probably provide the baseline of the standards for financial reporting on, on climate uh, in New Zealand under current government proposals. So what, what do you think of, of these in terms of the effect on, firstly, your, your own funds, but also, secondly, on on uh, on the investment sector as as a whole. John, do you want to take this one? Yeah, thanks, Barry. Um, look, if if we think emissions and um, disclosure around climate is important as an investor, then we need to have the data available, and we need to have um, confidence that the data has integrity. And um, you know, in our business, we measure the carbon intensity and the carbon transition risks of businesses. And you know, Rebecca talked about that earlier, how, how they're doing that as well. And that requires companies to disclose or you have to do your own research. And, and what you really want is consistent standards across companies, because we spend a lot of time scrubbing data and, um, and trying to make sure we're comparing like for like. Um, so we encourage consistent standards um, across industry, across the world. And I, I suppose the, the analogy I'd use is actually accounting standards. You know, if I'm gonna invest in, a 
tricky area like emerging markets or venture capital, at least if there's consistent accounting standards, I can rely on the information I'm being given. And that's what we need with climate reporting as well. We need that consistency and we need confidence in the integrity of the data. Cool. Sam? Oh, look, I think, Barry, you know, the issue here is that, you know, I there are probably 20 organisations in the world that are going to change this because, you know, money talks. And, and you're only going to change these corporate behaviours if you, well, one of the ways that we can change corporate behaviours, we can't change consumer behaviours, but we can certainly deny them capital or make capital conditional. And that's really 20, you know, or so organisations in the world that control most of the money. So from our point of view, the more money we give to the likes of, you know, FTSE, Morningstar, Vanguard, BlackRock, all those, that's how we will affect change. And, um, it, you know, and <clears throat> hopefully we can have enough money that we can afford to hire John one day and then he can go and, you know, rack, rack it up domestically for us. But it would be, it, you know, it, it, it's, um, I think we have to be careful about the role New Zealanders can play here. You know, I think we have to be very mindful of the fact that we're about to be in charge of, about $400 billion worth of investable assets, about half of that will be overseas. $200 billion starts to become useful to some of those 20 players, but you've got to empower them. Trying to do it yourself, uh, I'm not so sure that that's a, as smart a strategy. Also, it's a much more expensive strategy, of course. That's the great thing about ethical investing generally. Now, it's no more expensive. I mean, we're not paying any more for the Vanguard funds that we're invested in than we would if they were you know, unethical. So, but they need scale in order to achieve that. So if we can help, if we can help give them scale, and I think that's broadly the attitude most New Zealand fund managers should have. Yeah. And, and Rebecca, for you, I mean, the, of course, TCFD, the, the whole reporting system is also somewhat related to other initiatives that the government might take. You know, the government's, for example, would going to require uh, default funds for KiwiSaver to be a uh, fossil free. Uh, in the future. So what, what do you see as being the right role for government on, on these issues? Well, look, I mean, I guess if you think of our objective of a, of, as a country, and that's to be net carbon neutral by 2050, so we all have a role to play. And, you know, the, the government is proposing TCFD reporting for all asset managers, all asset owners, insurers, banks, etc. Um, and I, I get, you know, TCFD you know, if you follow the global framework, it is pretty consistent. And that, you know, that's what John said earlier, you know, consistency is what we need, um, just like accounting standards. And I completely agree. And um, you know, what the TCFD reporting does allow you to do is to really understand the risks that a business is going to potentially face into, um, especially with regards to climate um, change and climate risk, um, you know, things around, um, you know, increasing insurance and liability costs and stranded assets, so it's really important for investors to be able to understand that. You know, what we've found um, for the sectors where we've already started doing TCFD analysis and when we're engaging with companies and boards globally and domestically is that it allows us to have a different kind of conversation with management and boards around that risk. And that's, you know, really important and really insightful. I think with regards to the proposal here in New Zealand, I think there's lots of nuances that... Um, need to be worked through, you know, just um, inconsistent disclosure of companies is, is difficult, um, you know, and we're lucky that we're an active manager and have our own proprietary research um, that we can spend time kind of looking into that. Um, but so it, it will have its challenges, but, you know, this is the way that the world's going. Um, and there's been the CDB, uh, CDP and Gresby models that have done similar um, sorts of uh, modeling in the past and also the UNPRI has also made TCFD reporting mandatory for all signatories so um, you know whether we like it or not it's here um, and we need to um, I guess work with the government um, and industry to work out what is the most you know practical way of implementing it and the time frame to do that and exactly what will be disclosed and um, you know they talked about annual reporting but you know is there um, some sort of metric that should be provided to retail investors on fund updates or not, um, or, you know, is a carbon footprint actually more meaningful for a retail investor? You know, some will understand the nuances of this and it's, others won't. So let's, we, we talked about in the first panel about having clear, concise messaging to investors so that 
it's easy to understand. So we have to think about it from that angle as well. I think you're, you're right. I mean, it's not only information for investors to understand, it's information for the public to understand mm -hmm. and then be able to hold companies to account and, and funds to account. And uh, I think uh, to, to Sam's point, we do need to influence the global players, but we also need to make sure that we clean up our act and, and have our own house in order. And, and I think kind of having been around international negotiations on climate change for a long time, the power of the demonstration effect from the small country cannot be underestimated. You know, it's kind of what we do actually matters. Donald Trump even talked about us on, on COVID-19. So, uh, you know, he must be watching. Um, um, so, Gary, can I just ask Rebecca, you're still a default provider, right? AMP. So, uh, AMP Capital, not AMP. Oh, right. Sorry. Okay. I was just asking, just sort of maybe ask... Um, ask all the panelists a question. I'm kind of interested with this fossil fuel exemption they're proposing for the KiwiSaver default, because on one hand, it sounds really good, but on the other hand, it's going to be a devil of a thing to define, because that's the government then starting to mandate how capital is invested. And that's a huge difference from reporting to actually saying, you must invest this way before you receive um, effectively the government's business. And I find, yeah, does anyone have any views on that? I'm kind of, I'm kind of interested in how they'll end up defining that in a way that will work. Well, I think there's two things here, isn't there? The, the first one is TCFD reporting, which is separate to that, but I guess part of an overall government initiative to get to carbon net zero by 2050. Um, the fossil fuel producers, you know, if you do the analysis through the third party research, you know, you can look, get, you know, get a list of all the, fossil fuel producers, um, and it's quite extensive. I guess what I find quite interesting is I think um, for New Zealand Inc, I guess I'm, I find it quite positive that they're looking to do that. But I guess there, are, for me personally, there are some nuances around how, how they define it. Um, and, you know, I, I think it should be applied across asset classes. Um, and also you need to consider um, how renewables are considered, because even though if you were to do a blanket fossil fuel producer exclusion, there are some, um, some companies that fall into that category that derive that more of the, more than 50% of their business is from uh, renewable energy. So are we saying that those businesses, and they might be 50% today, but like next year, they might be 80 or 90% renewable. Mm -hmm. Are we saying that we don't want to invest and support um, those businesses who are transitioning to a low carbon economy and are actually doing some really neat smart cool things so i you know it's yeah yeah can i just add one thing on i'll just add one thing on that is um i with the default schemes I, i'm very nervous about um fossil fuels being excluded from them and and my view on default schemes is they should be um the lowest cost plain vanilla um, no reason for anyone to stay in there for any period of time. They are a parking space, they're a temporary fund. As soon as we have mandated, um, you know, fossil fuel exclusions, tobacco exclusions, whatever is mandated in there, suddenly it gives an ethical overlay to the um, default schemes and people just feel comfortable staying there and they already feel very comfortable staying there. We need to give people every reason to get out of, um, out of these temporary default schemes and in my mind, they should be moving out of the default scheme because it's got fossil fuels in it and move into ethical funds outside of there. And, and you know, yeah. my preference would be not to have it. I understand totally why it's being introduced. Uh, we'll probably... So the, uh, we're going to have to wrap up because it's uh, coming up to 8.30. I, I would say that you've all got your own definitions of excluding fossil fuels. I don't think it's... Uh, uh, a particularly onerous task for the government to to come up with with a uh, a definition which will be basically broadly consistent across the industry because there is actually a lot of coherence in that. So uh, um, you know we're we're certainly mm -hmm. keeping what the government does it and they put in place uh, a a decent set of rules around that. So uh, I guess we'll find out uh, about that fairly soon. Thank you all for joining us for a really, really good chat. Now, we, uh, we're we going to follow this up um, next week uh, because we've got Matt Winneray from uh, uh, from the New Zealand Super Fund uh, coming on. And the week after, we've got uh, Minister James Shaw. 
uh, uh, climate change minister. So uh, we're going to be continuing this thread of investment in climate change uh, for the next few weeks. Uh, for all of you out there who have come into this seminar, uh, please come back. There's uh, uh, information on Eventbrite and, and on our website page, www.mindfulmoney.nz, uh, about the next seminar. So I want to say huge thanks to um, John and Rebecca and Sam for this great panel. Thank you guys very much. And to reiterate my thanks uh, to Jane and the other panelists here tonight, um, we will hopefully see you again next week. If you want to support Mindful Money through crowdfunding, that would be very nice. Um, in the meantime, have a, uh, have a really nice evening and a great week ahead. Namihi nui kia koutou. Thank you. Thank you. See you.